Morning, guys. Um, I'm going to be really honest. I'm a little nervous. Um, I, I haven't done... I haven't spoken at a conference in the UK really of this size for um, yet. I've started the business in Australia, so please bear with me. Um, also, my team's in the room, and usually when I speak at conferences, I imagine you all naked, and if I imagine my team naked, I'd probably get sued. So, um, so uh, um, my name is Pip. I am the founder and the CEO of The Dots. Um, before I start, can you put your hand up if you've ever heard of the dots? And I'm not really expecting many people because we're really new here in the... Oh, amazing. Okay, I love you. Thank you. Um, we're, we're super new here in the UK. Um, I'm British originally, but I actually started the business in Australia. Um, so it's kind of amazing suddenly to be here in London where there's this huge, vibrant tech community. Australia was a brilliant incubator for us, um, much smaller scene, but it's just wonderful kind of being back in London. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but um, I'm going to sort of tell you a little bit about the dots and my journey um, and the sort of highs and lows that I've gone through. Um, and then I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to be really honest, when I started this journey, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I started this journey four and a half years ago, and I have seriously fucked up along the way. Um, excuse my language. Um, and I'm just going to tell you really candidly what I've done wrong, and I'm sure you'll be in this room going, how did she do that? What, what an idiot. But I want to kind of share my lessons that hopefully everyone in this room won't re repeat the mistakes that I've kind of made. So it all started back in Australia. I, um, my background is I was an economist by training, uh, got a first in economics at Edinburgh University, then joined the government as an economic advisor. Uh, from there, I actually jumped ship into the creative industries, which has always been my passion. So I used to work for the Brit Awards here in London, and then I moved down under to work for Viacom, specifically MTV. Uh, the reason we came up with the idea is while I was at MTV, I was just finding it really, really hard to connect with amazing creative talent, which sounds crazy because everyone wanted to work for MTV, but that was part of the problem. I would just get inundated with applicants. It was really hard for me to find talent. Um, the big problems that I had is I could never put a job on a job board with an MTV logo. We had about a thousand people applying for roles, most of which weren't relevant for the role. Um, for example, I used to get begging emails from people going, you know, it was a graphic design role and they'd say, you know, I've never done graphic design, but I love MTV and I can learn. And it was just a complete nightmare. At the same time, I couldn't use recruiters because it was really expensive to use recruiters. And LinkedIn just wasn't working for me um, in terms of creative recruitment. Um, there was two massive problems with LinkedIn. One was the lack of multimedia applications and the fact that I couldn't search and browse by work. The other problem with LinkedIn it is being built with a corporate industry in mind. So the features and the functionality are all built around the corporate industries. Um, at the same time, my then business partner, Matt Fail, um, he was director of digital for Viacom in Australasia at the time, was always being asked by creative friends for advice on building a portfolio online and their social media strategies. So he had a whole side business going on where he's helping people with portfolio sites and social. And what we kind of realized is there were lots of places to put work online. You could put stuff on Behance, you could get a Squarespace, but there was nothing that was specifically designed about helping creatives better commercialize, essentially helping creatives connect with industry. So typical startup, never done this before, dumped our entire life savings, which wasn't much, I was like 28 at the time, um, into building this platform from scratch. We started working from home. Um, Matt was a surfer, so I used to wake up in the morning and put on Skype and he'd be like half naked. Um, he promised me there was stuff on the bottom, but I never actually knew if he actually just worked naked. Um, and we basically started really kind of lo-fi, just wireframing the site on, on um, Matt's bedroom wall. Um, Matt was single at the time, luckily, because it was literally all around his bedroom. And just started sort of building it from there. And I guess this is where we see ourselves sitting in terms of the ecosystem that's out there at the moment. Um, we do three things and we do them really, really well. We help creatives promote themselves online. We help them network and collaborate. And the most important thing for me is helping them connect with real-world real world commercial outcomes. So helping creatives make money, which they can be 
terrible at, and they tend to undervalue themselves, and we're really trying to readdress that. So when I talk creative, our definition of creative is unbelievably broad. Um, it, we cover everything from the fashion industry, advertising, architecture, design, um, production, TV, film. The reason we're multidisciplinary is it's increasingly important for the different industries to collaborate now. Um, gone are the days where people used to work in silos. Um, an example of that is Facebook's one of our clients and has been for many years. You know, they're fantastic at hiring engineers, not so great at hiring designers. And um, they're building an advertising agency within Facebook at the moment, so they're intensively using us to actually poach talent from the advertising industry. Oh, I hate clickers, by the way. I always get them wrong. Um, so this is an example of the profiles on the site. So this is our alternative to your sort of dry LinkedIn profile, and it's all about the content and work take, taking center stage. Um, we are just over, we're just a year old here in the UK, and I've already got 1,400 clients, or more than 1,400 clients. These are some of the brands that have been using us to find talent. And that's what excites me every day, is every time that someone gets an opportunity on the site. So for me, it was all about connecting people with commercial outcomes. So in Australia, we started this four and a half years ago. In Australia, over 67% of the entire creative industry are active users of the platform. Um, and we have over 11,000 clients and we're profitable. Um, the most exciting thing about watching that growth is Australia is this tiny, tiny market in comparison to here. So the UK is 10 times the size. There's about 2.6 million people that work in the creative industries. But I must admit, what I am most proud of is we have helped connect 192,000 people to a specific commercial outcome, and we, can, we know that through the data on the site. And that's people either finding a job through the platform or finding a freelance opportunity through the platform. So that's kind of the context of the dots, but what I really wanted to talk about is the journey and the things I've learned the hard way. Um, uh, this, is, this is kind of a bit of a graph about the journey and how we started it. Um, everything on the top side of that graph is when I'm in my happy place, like I'm on top of the world, we're going to take over the world, it's going to be absolutely incredible. Um, anything on that bottom bit is when I'm crying on my husband's shoulder and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Why didn't I just go and work for someone else and get a paycheck and have holidays and all those kind of things that would be nice. Um, so to an outsider's perspective, in Australia, we were this huge tech success. Um, we had a commercial model from the beginning. We had really strong user growth from the beginning. Um, things were incredible. Within a year, we were doing over a third of LinkedIn's traffic. We were then profitable. And so, yeah, the, the kind of media loved us because we had this tech success. Um, the reality of what I've been through is actually that. Um, and hopefully a lot of people can relate to this in this room. I, my God, it has been the most insane roller coaster ride of emotions I have ever, ever been to, through. I wouldn't give it up for the world, but it has been, it has been really, really tough. Um, you know, everything from nearly running out of money twice um, to raising two rounds of investment to really mucking up on staffing to the point when we were scaling so fast in the UK that there was a point where it was like three minutes to load a page, which, swear to God, that feels like your baby is dying. I was like, oh, God. Um, so I'm going to kind of take you through some of the real product things that I've mucked up and, hope, and ways we've now fixed that. And it's been sort of a really, really exciting journey, and hopefully you can kind of relate from that. Um, I think the other thing I should mention is one of the biggest lows, though, and to give you a bit of a context, is this one here. So two years ago, um, my amazing business partner, Matt, got married, had a baby. And, you know, at the time, we were doing so well in Australia that there was no real need commercially to expand. You know, we could both have really beautiful lives and not actually have to work. So Matt didn't want to expand the platform globally. So I had to take the really, really, really tough decision two years ago to exit my business in Australia. I sold the shares in the business in Australia, 
and um, I ended up acquiring the global technology rights. I retained most of my team. We rebranded, so in Australia it's called The Loop, here it's called The Dots. Um, I then sunk everything I made from the exit into seed funding the business here. My poor husband, I'd been promising him a holiday for years, and suddenly I was like, all the money we made is going back into the business again. So I went from startup to scale up and went back to startup again, seed funded our first year here, um, and very excitingly, we just jumped straight to our Series A, which we just closed. Um, so it's been this insane roller coaster of a journey. So what are the product lessons I've learned the hard way? Um, you know, everyone, everyone will talk about team, and obviously the team, team is the most important thing with building a product, and it's about having the right people around you. And everyone talks about you need the top talent, and of course you need the top talent. And you know, we, a lot of what we do internally is making sure we're onboarding really, really fantastic people. But I think what people talk about less is the personality traits that are really important for startups and tech businesses. And I, I've, I've made some really disastrous hiring decisions. Um, there's been a couple of times when I've hired people that on paper look like they're going to be the most incredible people. They've come from huge organizations where, you know, they, they, they're just going to transform our business, or so I thought. But what I learned is actually, if they're not the right personality for a business, then they're not going to fit. And a startup is this crazy roller coaster ride. And if you've got people who whinge, who focus on the problems in, in a business, who are not positively trying to help build the business, it can be really, really divisive. Um, it's a bit like a, a rotten apple in a barrel cart. If you've got one really negative person within your organization, it can destroy the whole organization. Um, so my mantra is now only hire happy, positive people because, to be honest, I want people to come to me with solutions, not problems. I want people that I'm going to enjoy this journey with. We work crazy hours. You have to like the people we work with. So I think that's one of the most important lessons I've kind of learned. Um, the other thing I've learned, uh, and I'm, I'm expecting people not to agree with this, um, is you know, there's lots in the market about you have to have your engineering team right next to you. And the thing is, though, when you're trying to hire really incredible people, which we're always trying to do, I'm competing as a startup with Google and Facebook and other more established startups. And sometimes it's really, really hard to find top talent. And so my engineering team is actually offshore, and they are incredible. <laughs> Um, so they're based in Sri Lanka. Um, they are some of the most incredible developers I've ever worked with. Um, they are unbelievably loyal. I've had zero attrition in terms of development team, and they're the same developers that worked with me at my previous um, venture, um, which means there's been no kind of you know, lost time as someone jumped ship to go to another startup to, or to another organization. Um, product and design still very much sits next to us, but the engineering happens offshore. Um, we use a number of tools to kind of manage that process. Um, Slack, we find really useful for sharing ideas. Jira, in terms of managing the development. Um, and we love Envision um, in terms of the design. So, so, and then the other most important thing about managing an offshore team is communication. So we have what we call a dream team email, which is any time we get lovely feedback from one of our users or someone got a job on the platform, we email it round to dream team. So they're fully involved in everything that's going on. Um, we also do you know, weekly catch-ups with everyone that's over there, and it actually works really well. The other thing in terms of team is keeping a team. <laughs> um, as I said, I've had zero attrition in terms of my engineering team, but I've, I've lost staff in Australia because I burnt them out. Um, I'm not going to ask anyone to put their hands up if they're feeling at burnout point, but I've been there and there's, it happens. Um, I think this is a fantastic graph in terms of managing a team. Um, on the left-hand side is performance, and on the bottom axis is arousal, which I kind of think might be the wrong, 
kind of name for it. <laughs> Don't arouse my team in that way, just to be clear. <laughs> um, what arousal means is challenge, really. It's challenge, so people that are, you know, you're pushing them to learn, you're pushing them to work harder. Now, what happens is when someone is underutilized, they're not really learning, they're doing something that you know, they could do in their sleep, their performance per hour is actually low. But as you start pushing them and pushing them up their learning curve, and as you start kind of challenging them and you're doing longer hours, their performance actually starts going up and your performance per hour increases for the team as a whole. But there does come a point, guys, where you can push a team too hard, and I have done it where you've pushed them, they're working crazy hours, they're so out of their comfort zone, they're, you know, they start panicking. And the performance then start per hour starts going down. And you're, you, know, you may be working crazy hours, but actually, if you worked in five days instead of seven, you'd be much more effective. So where you want to get your team is up in that top bit, and that's when your team is in flow. That's when they're working really, really, really effectively. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to remember. I do a number of things. My team cannot work on the weekends. I will say I do, but that's slightly different. <laughs> My team cannot work on the weekends. They have to be out of the office by seven. Um, I'm constantly getting them trained up on things so that they don't feel overwhelmed on the kind of tasks that they have ahead. Other things in terms of the products. Um, when we first started the business in Australia, um, we completely kind of went into this, let's not tell anyone what we're doing because we're too scared someone's going to steal our idea mode. And we kind of did this whole, what we thought was a beautiful design for the platform. And then what happened is I actually showed it to some creatives and they hated the look and feel. Um, Matt was a surfer, so to be honest, it looked a bit like a surf brand. Um, and I learned this really important lesson that, you know, you've got to, you've got to share stuff with your users. And I know I'm pre preaching to the converted, hopefully, here. But it's so important to get out of the office and ask, ask your, your users about things, and not necessarily on how to improve the platform. I mean, interestingly, we do do surveys of our users, and we use a great tool called Typeform for that. But what I find with surveys is people just tend to recommend improvements on what they already see. The real innovation that's happened within our organization is when we just chat to people about what are their kind of challenges and what are, they trying to, what are the jobs they're trying to do. So an example of that would be we spend a lot of time speaking to our clients about how do they go through the hiring process, what do they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a kind of example of stuff that we've innovated because of that is a lot of businesses, their first port of call for hiring creative talent is to call up uh, trusted contacts and go off word of mouth, like, do you know a great designer? Do you know a great photographer? That's where they go first. And the reason they go there first is because talent in creative industries is important, but also are you going to be a good cultural fit? So straight away, we realized, you know, People are only coming to us as the second port of call. If they haven't got an existing black book of amazing contents, contacts to draw on, they'll then use the dots. But what we also realized is there's a massive friction involved. So if you're trying to find a UX designer and calling up a load of mates to go for recommendations, you have to email them, you have to phone them, then you've got to phone the person, then you've got to see if they're available, then you ask them for recommendations, and suddenly you've lost all these days trying to find people. So what we then did on the platform is try to remove that friction. So what you can do on the platform is you can build up a roster within the platform of people that you trust and contacts that you, you know are going to give good recommendations. So for example, BBH, which is one of our clients, they've got a roster of around 600 people that are on the platform. 
They can then go, OK, we need a um, motion graphic designer to work on this project. They can search motion graphic designer and say 30 people, a motion graphic designer is recommended by 30 of their trusted contacts. They can then see instantly if they're going to be a good fit for the organization. And everything's based on availability. And it's actually the feature that our clients love most. It's being able to find people by referrals and recommendations. And we would never have known that if we hadn't just listened, and we listen a lot. We also do monthly portfolio masterclasses around the city, um, and we do them in different offices around the city, and a lot of what I get my team to do, and a lot of what I do, is just ask people who come to those classes, what problems are you having finding a job? How do you go about finding a job? How do you go about finding a client? And it just fuels the inspiration within our organization. Um, so the, the other thing, ideas, you know, we, 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 we're kind of a creative business, so we have so many ideas. And my team are so passionate that the kind of idea flow is sometimes a little overwhelming. And so what kind of happened in the early days is suddenly someone would go, oh, I've got this amazing idea for the platform. And then we'd spend about half an hour discussing their idea. And I suddenly realized we're losing all of these man hours discussing ideas in the office. and. And we can't build everything, and you know you can't just be completely, um, you know, function rich without having any clear kind of objective way to build the platform. So what we started doing is we started doing internal pitch days, um, and we do these every two months. And it means if someone in one of my team comes up with an amazing idea for the platform, we ask them to put them in a folder. Um, and then every two months, they then review that folder and choose their top two ideas. The great thing about that is, firstly, that means they edit their own ideas. So that idea they thought was brilliant on Monday might not be that brilliant two months down the line. Um, the other thing is it really engages my team in the idea process. So every two months, we sit down, you get two minutes to pitch your idea, and then the team rip it apart for another two minutes. And it's just been this amazing way to involve all the team in that kind of um, idea phase. And then once we've kind of collected all the ideas, we plot it out on a graph like this, which is impact the impact it's going to have the business on, on the left-hand side, and then efforts down the bottom. And so obviously, the utopian is something that's going to have a huge impact, and it's going to be really low effort. Um, and obviously, if anything has a low impact and is high effort, that then gets removed. And you know, some of the best ideas for our business have come from the girl who does our customer service, because she's there on the forefront every day. And then she gets really excited when she sees her idea hit the platform. And then it makes the team feel like they're totally engaged in what we're doing. Um, the other thing I've kind of learned in terms of testing is um, we, you know, even though we kind of go through this whole idea process, some of our ideas are still absolutely shit, to be honest. Um, I had this amazing idea one day where, you know, people could actually interview people via video and ask a load of questions, and we can video those interviews. Do you know what? None of our clients gave a shit about it. Um, <laughs> excuse my language. Um, um, so, when it comes to the ideas that we push out onto the site, we really do down and dirty testing. Um, we get people in every week and clients in every week to see how they're using new features, see how they're testing. We go instantly to prototype. Um, we use tools like, has, have you guys know Hotjar? Um, Hotjar has been fantastic in terms of doing heat mapping on the site, so we can see where people are using their cursor on the site, and it's been a wonderful way to see where we've built something and people just get really confused on where to go. Um, we use Tableau for all our data collection. Do you guys know Tableau? Who uses Tableau? Okay, amazing. We use Tableau for our data collection. So Tableau, for those who don't know, it pulls in our data from Google Analytics, it pulls in our um, data from X0, which is our accounting software. It pulls in our data from our back end, and it just gives us a really, really good way of cross-checking all the data against each other. Um, the other thing that has always come out of meeting our users is how important design is. And 
you know, I'm, I'm constantly fighting this battle, but it is, people expect beautiful things now and beautiful usability, and I think it's got to be at the forefront of what everyone does. Um, InVision is such an amazing tool. They've just launched a trailer for a new video, which is about this, um, about this topic, so make sure you all watch the trailer. And obviously, this is a shameless plug, but that's why the dots exist, to help you find good designers and UXs. <laughs> um, I'm so being pushed off the stage. I'm really bad. I'm so sorry. Um, other things that I've learned is, um, this is my amazing CTO, Asanka. Um, I had one of the most painful three days of my life where we first pushed live news feeds at the dots, at the, at the business in Australia. And we went down for two days. It was, I had to, I was literally in bed with my phone next to my head. Asanka was calling me sort of every hour. I was getting up. The whole site was just covered in PHP errors. It was an absolute nightmare. I didn't sleep for two days. Um, and what I learned was that is a principle of five whys and trying to get to the core of what the problem was. Um, you know, in the end, there were so many issues on the site. Yes, those are the issues. But the root problem was is we didn't have a robust enough testing process. We didn't have a robust enough um, process for pushing live updates. And what I found within the organization is if we always ask five whys on a prod problem, it stopped that blame game thing where it's his fault, it's his fault, it's his fault. It's just helped us get to the root cause and fix the problem from the root so it doesn't happen again. And this is my final slide, I promise. <laughs> the final thing and probably the most important thing I've learned is this journey is absolutely crazy, guys. It's so wonderful. But what happens when you're managing a product and managing a team is you can run from pro project to project, feature to feature, win to win. And sometimes we never reflect on what we've achieved and the amazing things that we've done. So what we started at work is what we call the glory wall. Sorry, it's not a great name. Um, <laughs> sort of just stuck. Um, um, what we do every month is we have Friday beers um, and everyone sticks up three things that they've achieved over that month. And it gets stuck up on our wall at work. It's not pretty, but it's, it's this constant reminder of how far we've come. And it's everything from quotes like, um, I've, one of my amazing mentors just said, just don't fuck it up. Um, it's things like a great uh, kebab shop we found, but it's also feedback from our users, features that we've pushed live, things that have kind of really resonated with the business. And it's there, and it's, it's not only great for the team to see every day, but it's actually a really good talking point for when investors come in and you can kind of take them on the journey. Um, so I'm definitely got to get off stage. <laughs> But uh, I just want to say thanks to the Jam guys and have an amazing guy. And come say hi. Um, it would be lovely to say hi. It's, I'm so new in the market. It would be nice to meet you. Anyway, I'm going to get off stage now. <laughs>